Whenever one thinks of a democratic country struggling against the perceived evils of authoritarianism and control for the sake of idealistic notions of freedom and representation, the immediate thought is of the United States. In all of its 245 years of its founding, the democratic superpower of the United States of America has been a gigantic pin in the cockboard wall that is modern international history. From the southern depths of Chile to the far end of the Pacific in Japan, the influence of the United States has all but been omnipresent. But two stand out as the most prominent in the public sphere when it comes to dictatorships. The fascist Nazi Germany of World War II, founded by Adolf Hitler, and the communist dictatorship of the Soviet Union, founded by Vladimir Lenin before coming under the complete dictatorship under Joseph Stalin. Between the United States and Soviet Union, they were far more reserved and controlled in their conflicts. Why? Because of this guy and this small thing. The development of nuclear armaments forced the United States and the Soviet Union to play fair, as far as clandestine spy operations, mass surveillance of their own people, and the throwing of threats around could be considered as fair. They couldn't risk throwing nuclear bombs around without assuring each other's mutual destruction. There should be a word for that. Ah, cool. But while today the idea of having a new Cold War is becoming more prominent, the development of the historic Cold War only served to empower both sides. The conflict just made them both improve, together, to different extents. The Cold War was an era between 1947 and 1991, a conflict of which the foundation was from their ideological differences between the democratic United States and the communist Soviet Union. Thought to be so different in ideological differences that scholars had considered reconciliation impossible. But even so, the convergence between the United States philosophy and Soviet Union philosophy was imminent, with scholars believing that for reduction of internal tension and increased integration with conflicting ideologies, that the a priori or naive belief systems must be criticized and modified by a posteriori or scientific philosophy. The extent of the conflict covered nine United States presidents and seven Soviet premiers. But I want to talk about something less notorious than the likes of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Korean War, or the Vietnam War. I want to talk about SALT. No, not that SALT. I'm talking about SALT II, the Strategic Arms Limitations Talks of 1979, where United States President James Jimmy Carter and Soviet Secretary Leonid Brezhnev signed the SALT II Treaty, which would discourage the manufacturing of nuclear weapons. It was a continuation of the 1972 SALT talks by previous President Richard Nixon who, for some reason, couldn't complete his second term to completion for no particular reason. <coughs> On June 18, 1979, President Jimmy Carter met Secretary Brezhnev at Hofburg Palace in Vienna, Austria, where they would sign the SALT II Treaty, agreeing to ban new missile programs and limit new strategic missile type development and construction. This was supposed to be a pleasant event, where the United States and Soviet Union make a show of approaching a level of moderation. Six months later, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, and the United States discovered Soviet combat brigades in Cuba, and thus President Carter withdrew the treaty from consideration. This document, a letter sent from Secretary Brezhnev to President Carter, was sent on February 25, 1977, two years, four months before the SALT II treaty signing, and one of the multiple stepping stones of Cold War history. The general remarks in favor of peace and curtailment of the arms race coincide with our own aspirations. We are definitely for the ultimate liquidation of nuclear weapons and for universal and total disarmament under effective international control. However, advancement forward toward these elevated goals will be slowed down. If we do not value what we already managed to accomplish in this area, now it is proposed to us to withdraw the whole question of cruise missiles from the agreement. How should we understand this return to a stage which we moved beyond long ago, and being forced to face this absolutely hopeless proposal? To put it lightly, the Soviet Union wasn't very easy to negotiate with. In response to this letter, President Carter sent this. Dear Mr. General Secretary, your letter of the 25th of February raised in me some concern because of its moderately sharp tone. 
because in it there was no recognition of my own good intentions I think it would be extremely useful. If you shared with us your own views on a significant reduction of strategic forces levels which we could achieve in the next four or five years we were inclined to take small steps in the direction of a vague future, I propose that instead of this, we now strive to define a concrete, longer term goal, towards which later could advance step by step with a greater guarantee of success. A clear attempt on moderation, diffusing of tensions and negotiation by the United States President is being made here, which the SOC 2 signing two years later would prove to be somewhat fruitful, if temporary. But what the content of these two letters have is only a small minuscule footnote of the Cold War. In these two letters there is a representation of the interactions between the heavily hostile communist dictatorship and a perceived moderate democratic republic. The influences and language that they use, the accusatory paranoia associated with the Soviet Union, the attempted compromise of the United States, stances of which have influenced each other so deeply that even in modern day, we still see the influence permeating the two countries. Even in academia, the studies of the Soviet Union were at best misinformed or at worst outright defunct in the United States, having failed in establishing a consensus on Soviet affairs such as being unable to develop an adequate framework of conceptualization and definition. To go into detail about the growth of democracy from the Cold War and interactions between democracies and dictatorships in general, we must detail the parts of democracy of the modern world that has shown interactions with authoritarian influence. First off, The military, the armed forces of the countries with a single directive to defend the interests and the land that they live on. Military forces of industrial and post-industrial societies in the 20th century possessed a divided mind, generally subordinated to the larger political systems that they supported, yet committed to a primal sense of identification as warriors. The United States has a standing army to defend your own interests as well. And within the Cold War, questions were raised about reconciling democratic values with the cost of continual mobilization. American intellectuals had a distrust of large standing armies out of fear of resource allocation and military coup. Thus, they approached defending democracy as a fighting faith, one to defend and to willingly subject themselves to the scrutiny of as a pseudo-religious doctrine that maintained the stability of Cold War America. But with the proxy wars of Korea and Vietnam, strong standing armies became the norm for the superpower. With a modern standing army of 1.4 million soldiers, it appears that the worries of the American intellectuals have been completely silenced. An example on how military suppression is key to the definitions of modern civil military relations is the 1999 Pakistan coup of General Pervez Musharraf. In 2007-2008, General Musharraf yielded power to civilians from severe legitimacy problems triggered by his rule. Faced with extreme civilian backlash after multiple assassinations and abuse of civilian prisoners, as well as the losing faith in General Musharraf himself, the military institution withdrew active support from him to preserve institutional esteem. Losing crucial backing of his commanders and pressured domestically and internationally, he relinquished his army post on November 28, 2007. Dictatorships run on this concept of military suppression and absolute loyalty to the premier or whatever position that they place as leader. Modern understanding of attempting to avoid bloodshed is now universally accepted knowledge and practiced, knowing they will only sabotage the country's stability in the long term. Communist governments were set up in each of the countries, and each became a satellite of the USSR. Yugoslavia, under its own dictator, Marshal Tito, the populist, a politician that's managed to appeal to the civilians, to relate to them, and to present themselves as their champion against the elite. On the definition of democracy, populism is, theoretically, democracy, having a politician elected with the will of the people. However, it is the people willingly placing themselves under the rule of an authoritarian with the belief that their champion will do as they desire. Dictatorship is one of the foundations of modern populism, and yet populism is not dictatorship. Populism is, by the most layman's terms, an authoritarian form of democracy. In modern day, the title of populism has been thrown around to describe any leader nowadays, such as the likes of the United States Trump, the United Kingdom Johnson, and of course, the Brazilian Bolsonaro. But where dictatorships force the people to repeat the claims of purity, 
populace convince the people that they truly are that pure, which by itself is far more sinister than any suppressive dictator could ever be. Time will only tell if we as the collective human race will be able to overcome this fall from democratic grace. Religion has always been a powerful social force among the peoples of these lands. Ethicalities surrounding the treatment of humans by dictatorships are more of suggestions than rules. Repeated swings between dictatorships and democracies are more common as one would think. But the one type of individual that suffers the most in these situations are the civilians. Take Thailand, for example. The period of 1973 and 1976 is seen as a crisis of modernity for the country as an attempted democratic adaptation of Western ideals failed to incorporate modernization as the dictatorship returned in the October 1976 with the return of previously ousted dictator Field Marshal Tanom Kitikachon. But this resulted in a nostalgia for stability rather than inspiration to continue development with a growing opposition to the introduction of democracy. Thailand came under the control of Sangrat Chavrolu under a military dictatorship once again. But what I wish to emphasize upon is the date of October 6, 1976, the massacre of protesters against the right-wing military dictatorship. They were shot at with war-grade weaponry. Men were dragged across the street and burned alive. Some were hung from tamarind trees with dead bodies mutilated and, if they were female, sexually attacked. And all of the while, crowds gathered to cheer the displays of the brutality, having bought into the far-right propaganda and hatred peddled by the military dictatorship. None of the perpetrators were held accountable. But even in the most primitive industrial states, such as Albania and Bulgaria... The United States lost their greatest rival with the Soviet Union's collapse in 1991 due to the more liberal premier of Mikhail Gorbachev attempting to open a new Soviet era of democratic cooperation, a distinctly democratic facet. The United States thus became more focused on consolidating their international power, turning their attention to the new rising power of the East, China, and other communist countries. While stable industrialized democracies do not engage in overt international war with each other, democratic foreign policy does use force covertly against the existences or policies of other elected governments. This covert force is what we call spy agencies and operations, similar to the ones conducted by the Cold War American CIA or the Cold War Russian KGB. For the Americans, the best example of this covert force is in Chile, 1973. The democratically elected socialist President Salvador Allende had become president in a non-socialist political economy. The United States, uncomfortable with a socialist leader on the neighboring continent, had their then President Nixon to make it clear that anti-Allendez violence had US support. Allende committed suicide and his successor Augusto Pinochet refused to grant voting rights to the citizens after he took power. Further examples of Haiti, Nicaragua, and even the British Guiana only confirm that the United States hadn't left their Cold War with just a victory, they had left with plenty of pages ripped from the Soviet Union's playbook. The destruction of a dictatorship and the re-democratization of a country, such as that of Italy's Mussolini, is described as a three-step process of political learning. 1. The breakdown of the dictatorship. 2. The creation or reconstruction of a democracy and three, the consolidation of a new regime. The United States, for the sake of their own national interests, have circumvented this process and reversed it for their own means, corrupted by the fear and paranoia that the Soviet Union had once made their empirical order. Ultimately, this shows that there is a firm difference between totalitarianism and dictatorships. Where totalitarianism is total domination and singular and abusive, Dictatorships are integrated parts or unproblematic parts of a government, even a democratic one. Cold War is understood as being solely about the expansion and retraction of each form of state and society. Conspiracies by radical communists are not always the case when it comes to true democracy, with different state society forms being created from these third world revolutions. It was just that the ideological frameworks of revolutionary leaderships, the social forces within them, 
and their national aspirations simply just had more in common with the elements of the Soviet Union than the United States. We will never know how the world would have been like if the Soviets had won the Cold War. But the state, the democracy, in all of its idealistic and optimistic glory, had defeated the evil dictators in the Cold War and came out relatively unscathed would be to undercut the Cold War's impact on the world and its future. The world wouldn't have been the same without the Cold War and democracy wouldn't be democracy without dictatorships. Cooperation is the foundation of human society. In academia, the most esteemed and civilized members of society often learn to passionately intelligent human beings. There is no such thing as ideological conflict, at least for those worthy of calling themselves members of schools. Even American physicians believe in fostering of close cooperation, especially with Soviet physicians, in the pursuit of human progress. The world of today, with the desensitized notions of the terms fascist and dictator in common tongue, is just a follow of a world that forgot how it got here, a world that ignores its history. Today, we see this once more between the United States and China. But possibly with a sense of relief, there is hope that this will not be like the Cold War of the past. Despite China remaining outspokenly communist, scholars will argue that despite rhetoric and rising tensions in US-China relations in the recent decade because of this guy, the historic Cold War was an international outcome, not one just between the two superpowers. No matter how powerful one country was, they must cooperate with the others to actually have any significant tensions such as the Cold War with the widespread ideological influence of extremely powerful parties and their subordinates. But as shown with the likes of Gorbachev on the global stage, one must not forget who they are in this world. He who fights monsters should see to it that he himself does not become one. And if you gaze for long into the abyss, the abyss also gazes into you.